<laughs> it's either a Tory or <laughs> Oh, Lena. I want to welcome everybody and thank you all for joining us virtually for the Central Arkansas Library System's 2021 Six Bridges Book Festival. Um, I want to thank CALS and all of the sponsors and partners and supporters for helping making this important event happen, even in the middle of a very relentless pandemic. So thank you all for joining us. We are truly honored and thrilled to have this opportunity to have a conversation with the author of The Last Nomad, Coming of Age in the Somali Desert, Shugri Saheed Sal. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you, So glad you're here. Shugri Saheed Sal was born in the desert of Somalia in 1974 and spent her early years living as a nomad. In 1992, she immigrated to North America after the Civil War broke out in her home country. She attended nursing school at Pacific Union College and graduated with honors. And although The Last Nomad is her first book, Sugri has been storytelling since she was raised. She heard stories and learned of their power uh, to entertain, teach, and transform from her grandmother and the nomadic community. When she isn't writing her, her tell or telling stories, she's working as an infusion nurse. Wow. She lives in Sonoma County with her husband and three children. Again, welcome. <laughs> I love your cute accent. It's just, I think, it's so beautiful. I'm going to be practicing that one soon, Lena. I may come for a visit. Lena, talk to me again. That's right. They say y'all. <laughs> y'all. We're going to say y'all. Well, thank you so, so much, Lena. That is so kind. I am so thankful for everybody who's joined, for you, Lena, for Nathan, for putting the background, all of this uh, technical yes. for getting us through. I'm really, <laughs> truly, truly honored, and, and I'm really happy everybody is going to be um, part of my village, you know. Um, so thank you so much. Um, so if you want to just get the conversation started mm -hmm. by reading us, an insert from your book and setting the stage for everyone who may yeah. not have had an opportunity to I'm read gonna, your book. Sorry, I cut you off. Go ahead, Lena. No, go ahead. I was going to say, I'm going to read the prologue, a little bit of the prologue, just to give a background to what a nomad is, just a little bit of it. And then I wanted to tell everybody that um, after the prologue finish, every book, Every chapter starts with, let's see, there's an angle one must hold. Can, is that better? Yes. Okay. Uh, every chapter starts with Somali proverb. And I have to careful not to say the other word, because other word, Somalis cannot say the letter P. So I have to say Somali proverb, you know, okay, <laughs> slowly and gently. And so in this first chapter, it says, Hoyade <laughs> Alongside with me, mother gave birth to an indomitable will. And it's translated by my late brother. Oh, wow. yeah. So I'm gonna get started. Um, I'm a nervous reader, so I would say, excuse me, I had, you know. Okay, let's see. Prologue. I am the last nomad. How can I be the last when nomad still exists in that faraway desert where I grew up? So how can I make a, such a bold statement? What I'm really trying to say is I am the last person in my direct line to have one sleep like that. And now I feel like the soul keeper of my family stories. As I sit here in my home in California, weaving my tale for you, the weight of that responsibility urges me on. All of my ancestors from both sides of the family were nomads. They traveled the East African desert in search of grazing land for their livestock and the most precious resource of all, water. When they exhausted the land and the clouds disappeared from the horizon, their accumulated ancestral knowledge told them where to move next to find a greener pastures. They loaded their hats and belonging into the most obedient camel and herded their livestock for a, to a new home. My nomadic family was at the mercy of the weather. At the end of of July, the long dry season, when the clouds finally rumble with rain, we look up to the, at the sky with a renewed hope. As the desert quenched its thrust, the red earth crackled back to life. 
responsibility is adults to welcome the rain with drums, singing and dancing. Children get fat and healthy. Sitting around the fire at night, they soak in the folk tales and poems passed down from generation to generation. But despite the renewed abundance of food, we knew we had to preserve uh, some of the, it for the dry season to follow. Sometimes drought hit harder than usual, killing both livestock and people. Bones and twigs soon litter the train with the goats and sheep when it's happily grazed. In those times, my ancestors ceased singing under the moon. Their, drum, their drums hardened and they longed for good news. Children no longer heard stories by the fire and an old po poet will bellow to the desert, voicing his agony. He would speak of a dying land taking his precious camel. His mournful poem will travel through time and across border to remedy the pain of his people for years to come. My three children raised in California know nothing of a nomadic life except the stories I have shared. As I sit here now in my comfortable suburban home, listening to my teenager son excited me tell me about his favorite YouTuber. I am reminded acutely of the void between my past and my present. I speak of a world which he had little understanding. And uh, an old African prophet says, when an elder dies, a library is burned. I am not an elder yet, <laughs> but I do feel I, I do feel like a portal between two worlds. I am the last person in my immediate family who holds this particular library of knowledge. As the years pass, sense of urgency I feel about sharing my experience with my children and with the world grows. In my imagination, I have shared my story with each of many with each of you many times as we gather under a clear black sky it is it is shiny stars guiding my ancestral wisdom i have imagined you leaning into me as if i have brought the news of a drought of uh, news of water after a drought i have poured us some t some tea for i for i knew it was going to be a long night under the luminous moon I want to get this tale of mine right. The fire between us has crackled with excitement and as if to notch my story along. But now it's no longer enough for me to just imagine telling you my story. I feel the need to bring up, to bring you all to the fire and into my world. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. I know, that's so beautiful. So no, tell me, I mean, you're a nurse in training. Yeah, I am a nurse, infusion nurse. Yeah. Right, infusion nurse. And so what, this is a total, you're using totally a different side of your brain, right? When you're oh. writing. Is. Yeah. <laughs> so tell me why your story, and it was so important for you to be able to go through this process and write a book and share that you're the last nomad. Yeah, you know, Honestly, like the book of the Talib, like it says in the prophet, when an elder dies, a library is burned, right? That African prophet, what it's saying is, um, think of, I think the, the best analogy I can give is the matriarch of an elephant herd is, a, is an older elephant female who knows the land very well, who knows how the things are uh, 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 you know, lay of the land, who knows far away how to find water. All of this wisdom leaves this old elephant, matriarch um, elephant, right? And often the mistake that happened, I mean, human is right. Sometimes we should done this matriarch mom. And what happens is, is it literally rips through. The, the young one get lost. That knowledge is lost. Whoever take off is kind of finding his way from flailing this way and that way and herd can die off like that, right? Yeah. Hopefully in this case, it's not too extreme, but I really felt like I had a unique situation growing. Here I was a daughter of a nomadic mother and a well-educated father who fought over my destiny so fiercely. And in the end, despite my mother winning at that time and dropping me in the desert to give me for good to be with her mom, I felt that the desert gave me so much knowledge of what a nomad is, a life skills that, that was put upon me, imparted me by my nomadic, witty, poetic, 
you know, strong mom, a grandmother, is what really I did not want to let it die. And this is a culture that not so many Somalis are now a nomad because obviously drought makes it impossible. Uh, rain is um, unpredictable. It's not like they can now even forecast, you know. So I feel like I didn't want this wisdom to die. And if I didn't give it to, <laughs> if I didn't really write this um, book, <laughs> excuse me, everybody, I've been having <coughs> some coughing fit lately. Yeah. Uh, so I have to in between take water. Not that I'm being rude, but just <laughs> wet my tongue. Yeah. So I feel like, Elaine, I just didn't want this wisdom to die with me. My children know a little, but all that I I excavated for you and dig it up and like an archaeologist bring it out for you, I don't think they have that much knowledge. And I'm glad I'm leaving not only for my children, but to the world. Yeah. And so you talk about your grandmother, um, Ayo, is that how you say it? Ayo. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you, you, you have that halfway there with the Somalis, huh? <laughs> and how fearless, you know, she she was, and the courage, the sense of courage and independence that she instilled yeah. in you, yeah. and the le- lessons that you've learned. Do you want to share more about that and how it helped you face the challenges as a child and as an adult now? Yeah, my grandmother, like I said, was a poet, uh, was really a warrior of her her own. At that time, Lena, camel tamers, people who tamed camels were uh, male, right? Um, People who heard camels were male. And as I learned during writing of my book, actually my, and I remember her doing that. It's just, I took it for granted, right? That's every, I thought like everybody does that, but it turned out to be as my sister, Arafa pointed out is it's no, my grandmother did that. So growing up under the shadow of this fierce woman who I saw her fought with lions, do this thing, tells me how to survive. If I see a lion, if I see hyena, what to do? I'm thinking, you know, I remember the scratches her body all over. She was just one with the element, right? Had no feet and actually died an old age, you know, meaning no animal killed her for all this, you know, living in this old desert like drought hit. I remember learning um, um, that my the poetry she created that when she first composed her first poetry in which she has to say it while people are literally clapping for you. She was only 12 and she did that poetry because she became indignant when the sub when her, the woman of her sub clan lost it. And she had to actually sneak snack out to, to follow the big girls into the, this uh, kind of a youngster gathering, a poetry slam and say, I'm gonna just tell you how it's done. And <laughs> that poem will travel time and years. And to this day, a lot of people know the poem. They may not necessarily know it's my beloved grandmother. So that is the woman I grew up um, under her shadow. And I was telling a story recently, um, Working as a nurse this pandemic time, it was hard. And I end up getting really sick, not from COVID, so people anxiety can uh, come down. But um, but I got sick from <coughs> um, I got sick from just working 12, 13 hours, right? I was just working to death to help patients not go to the hospital where people were catching COVID, right? So I worked myself to death. And what happened is I end up having some gallbladder surgery. Mm -hmm. And it was a mistake to do the surgery while I was already very sick and weak. I was having migraine. And what the result of what happened is I literally, my body shut down. I couldn't eat food. I dropped 20 pounds from here. I was a walking skeleton. And honestly, Lena, the only reason I got through is because like, I couldn't even walk two, two steps without just falling. Water. Drinking water was like pouring acid into my esophagus. This whole area was raw. And I literally dug my way through, out of that hole to be today this person who are talking to me. Uh, basically, I think my skin is fine. I, I don't like, <laughs> you know what I mean? I look like some wet human being. <laughs> so, so that is, I, I think I always knew no matter what happens to me, unless it's the end that I can always come through it. And that is because I come from 
epigenetically, I'm wired for resilience, hardness, gridness, adaptability, all that are in the fabric of my being. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we, we talked a little bit about this and, you know, you speaking of how you were sick, about how you wrote this book um, to be about healing. And yeah. do you want to elaborate more on that and what you want people to feel when they read your story, even the hard parts? Yeah, uh, I think this book, I wrote it with a complete honest, you know, if I kiss a boy, I tell people, right? <laughs> If I, if I was a broken heart, I tell you, people, if I if I was chased by a war, everything, it, it's, there's humor in it, there's almost getting rape in it, but you always see me just always joking around a little bit, right? Because that is really, that humor is, it's just me. I'm always trying to be silly a little bit, right? Take it So um, you were asked, Lena, could you repeat that? You asked me something like... Um, how you want the book you want people to feel it's yeah, about so, feeling it's about you. yeah thank you lena in this tough time right we yeah. are, have all been locked out lena i I, I, I survive, I'm okay. But many of you lost your parents, your aunties, your friends, a lot of you lost. My goodness, as, if I, if, as a nurse, I know that many of you suffer and I really feel for you. You know, it's been a tough two years, right? So this is one thing that tells you, yes, you can survive. Yes, you can continue, you know? And at the same time, it's a really a beautiful story and it is something you learn a world that is completely different from you. And if I may add that to, you know, when we share our stories, we understand each other, right? Stories have a way of creating a deeper connection and understanding and love and humanity and similarity, you know? So I really, that is, if, you, if, if everybody is that village that gets this book out there and you enjoy it, that is just makes me very happy. And um, I gave it to this book, Lena, one time. There was, I was seeing a patient and um, I come from the patients. I kept seeing this woman who was just going through a horrible divorce. And I can see she just looked like really not a, she was just falling apart, exhausted. And the guy was giving her a hard time. So I felt, I gave it to her, the book, not thinking to get anything back. I said, this was the extra copies I the publisher sent to me, I gave it to her and I left. She went to my patient, they said, who was that woman who gave me? So she searched me and she found me and she's like, you come through for me the right time. And I didn't know, I was just giving her because I felt like she needed somebody to tell, like I survived through refugee camps, I survived through female circumcision, I survived through crazy war hawk chase, I survived through everything. I survived through a mis the most misogynistic culture who every time wants to step with us, like our Me Too movement as a Somali people, it's like, it's an extreme version, right? Right. <laughs> I am here, Lena, yet I am here. So that is what I left her. And that is what helped me, helped her in the end to lift her up, she said. So it made me very happy to hear that. Well, for people who may not really know what it is like being a nomad, and they may not have read the book, tell us, what is the day-to-day -day life like of being a nomad? And what do you miss most about the nomadic life in Somalia? Yeah, oh, so being a nomad, I'm gonna write it down, so be, being a nomad and what I miss, right? Yes. So um, being a nomad, think, so, so nomads are people who are, like I was saying in, uh, into the quick things I was reading, it, we are, live in the desert. In this case, I lived in the desert of Somalia. We, our house is made of, ha a, we call it a hat, right? Uh, we call the hat, the nomadic hat, right? Uh, it's usually made of sticks together, make animal uh, skin or something that's made of grass as covering. In front of you, when you could step out of the hat, you would see fences fences for enclosures for your animals so these are your goats maybe the baby goats are either tied separately or tied within the fence but into a branch you know so they don't suckle that at night there's one for camel and then every day we wake up we brush our teeth we get ready our day we drink camel milk or whatever and then the whole day is about herding your animal protecting your animal from lions hyenas fox 
Gudunene, which is like a bab cut, and it's a red one, as you, you see me talk about. Your whole day is like that, right? God forbid you come home if you, uh, clans fight, war, wars happen, uh, 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 animals get eat. You come, you encounter lions and hyenas, which you are no match of. Then by the end of the day, you come home, and if you come home safely, you make sure your animals, um, animals are milk, fence it, all of that, and then you sit by the fire. In, in that time, also youngsters used to sneak out and then they will have their own um, mingling, nomadic mingling in the desert somewhere under the moon. So those think that's what is a nomad. What I really miss about it uh, is um, the freedom, the fast open land, listening of just going around your own, listening the sound of the birds, the, just echoing, right? Just all these beautiful sounds that nature gives you. Uh, just the fast open land, the, um, the the social gathering of storytelling, the the wisdom that imparted on you, the the being brave that expected on you to be built on you. So there's a lot of things I miss. I often describe, like because I know I cannot go home now. I, I I have moments when I'm just imagining, like feeling, sift that my fingers, you know, sifting the sand in my fingers, or like, um, or just touching the walls of Mogadishu, or just being there. I have this deep longing that I have for my country, and it's because Somalia and I owe each other closure, right? Like right. a bird whose nest was burned, I just flew away in terror and never went back. So Somali and I owe each other a visit. So that's beautiful. Thank and so like, what are some of the programs or support in communities that can offer new refugees and immigrants resettling in America, to, in America to help them um, mm -hmm. set up for success? I mean, you, you are a prime example of someone who's been extremely successful, but what can be done to help others who may need support? Well, thank you so kind. You're so kind. I am still in progress of success, right? Hopefully, <laughs> one day I'll make it something. But I think, uh, for one thing, um, before we even move to, um, I often tell people for refugees or for anybody who's coming here, just be a friend. Simple thing anybody can do is help them navigate because I once was this lost person who I wish someone can just show me in, his, in, in the in and outs of that country. I felt bewildered. I was overstimulated. It was too much to take into coming from Somalia, who was one turn, war torn, and then arrive in Canada in the dead of min winter, being a desert daughter. It was a lot coming at me. And I was like, I felt like I was. Being, just being living a daily life, I felt like I was doing a surgery, uh, performing a highly skillful surgery, and then go home. I, my brain was that stimulated and exhausted. Um, I wanted to tell you all that I'm always sending money, like to my families, to a relative of mine who was, it literally today, I was talking to my sister. I said, did you send that money? And I'm not talking about later. It's not even 100. Literally, it's like a lot of money because God knows so-and-so on her goes die and she needs the money. Your cousin gave birth and needs the money. Um, uh, another one, uh, you know, clan attacked him and he needs the money. He broke a leg and his, her eyes, it's just never finished. And often my friends are telling me, Shukri, you are always giving money to these people who you have to find a way to get help with it. So perhaps what I, maybe my, my plan is, in the meantime, I'm looking for organizations that I can really find to help people because really I, now that I'm gaining somewhat some attention, I think I need to have some kind of a place where I can direct people to help people out, you know? Right. So I am really putting together. I cannot say I have something, but there are, um, there is a girl who called Il Ilham Foundation. This is a young girl in Somalia. She's a fellow Canadian who is helping youngsters, women who are raped. So in the meantime, if people, I will find you that one so you can share in, in the link to help that girl. And then I will find a ways to help all of these refugees. There are a place called Dabab in around Kenya where refugees are really having a very tough time. So that's a very good question. And I think... 
uh, the world is now, we know that everything affects us. We can no longer say Ali and Nancy are there, their problems are not mine, right? Yeah, we exactly. see how COVID affects us all, right? That I get sick, you get sick, and it's, it's, we have to look at this as a community. And so the whole world is a community and we need to all be kind and helpful and yeah. I think that's definitely something people can learn from your story, Mm -hmm. how you all work together as a community. You were all in it together. And honestly, I think this pandemic has helped us to see that as Mm -hmm. well. Um, I'm always cooking for, that's another thing I do is like, uh, like I'm a lot of African women are gifted this ability to cook for a lot of people. I'm always cooking for friends, whether she has a breast cancer. So it, that's a simple thing you can do for people before you even think of refugee. There are things we can think, be a, your neighbor's keeper, right? Always, right. even right. as simple as getting a job, someone who's so different from you, who needs an opportunity, really. Right. like Exactly. Well, I also want to mention for those who are listening, um, feel free to send in a question or you know through chat or through the q a if you want us to, if you want me to ask any questions on your behalf i will definitely do that um back to your book let's talk about the last nomad and yeah. um you gave detail about your experience of the civil unrest and instability and the violence um mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. that happened what what helped you make sense of your sudden displacement from your home mm-hmm. and um the time at you were in the refugee camp, like tell us about that experience. And I think um, Somali civil war was one of those things that no one really expected it to go as bad as it went, right? And uh, at the time, Lena, when Somalia is about to crumble down, right? Mm-hmm. What was America busy with, right? Iraq war, right? Yes. So we were kind of a very unlucky. Um, folks that that this small country is about was having its worst wars and craziness was happening and America couldn't even help us because a lot of countries couldn't help it's just was so many you know it was happening so one thing that really helped me was first of all my whole family as I describe in the book we traveled together so even when we were getting attacked by lions we were I'm not alone 250 family of us travel. That is a risk when a person, at, when you get attacked because you die in great numbers, but it's mm. also a good thing when you have your old family together. I was also a teenager. So what are teenagers for, known for? Invisibility. <laughs> I felt like death's not coming for me, right? It is a desperate time, but the idea of me dying, but also the, the survival, right? Um, I remember like one of the scenes, as you know, describing coming to the Kenyan border desperate, like people were really, kids were dying of um, malnutrition, escape. There's all kind of diseases that was just flaring up, opportunistic diseases that sees the situation, right? And here I was, I couldn't go into Kenyan um, borders. Apparently there were borders among African countries. I didn't know that. There was a news that I showed up, I'm like, you can't go in. I almost get raped. It was all this happening to me, but I felt like yet I knew I can survive, you know? So that is really using your community, knowing your families is there, um, just being wired up for that, you know, like, w- like by the end of the night, I remember after all of the suffering, we just put some kind of a shawl over a tree and we just huddle underneath it. And then when the, it comes night or, or when night comes, we just start making tea. We just start telling stories. We were talking about, uh, you know, we are the nations of poets and, and orators. We just gather and told the stories to each other. So that is my people. Like the most resilient people I have met in this world are really Somalis. Like they, yeah. I mean, I am not even like they will look at me like I, I'm not even not I'm nothing like th- there are some people who have some heroic stories and yeah yeah well speaking of that you do get into like the brutal process of female genital mutilization mm-hmm. mut- mutilation mm-hmm. and um, how it was normalized almost in Somalia and just tell us the relationship of that and the beliefs that 
you know, about female virginity and how important that was and share that. Um, okay. So thank you. Yeah. We talked about how that could be hard, but you said it wasn't really hard for you to talk about it. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's interesting because it's one of those things, it's not even how I accepted it. It is what it was and I, I lived through. The reason I wrote about this chapter is because you know, I really wanted to give first of all every way insight, right? As you see, when I was writing in the book, I talk about the mindset that get us there. We are desert people, so, uh, and warring clans, right? How do they wanna make um, uh, peace and passage of, to, to, to a new land or to even move with peace. That was because they gave each of a virgin daughters, right? To seal the deal. And if you were not virgin, like you create a disaster for the clan. And so what I was trying to make you understand, Lena, and, and everybody is the idea grooming for it, right? I have been shamed all my life for it. Mm -hmm. So by the time I come of age, like the time to be done. I am myself sick because almost you wanted to join that rank of a good girl, right? You end up having a higher uh, statue, like the girls who didn't have that, have it end up being inferior to you. And what happened was my grandmother, who this fell upon after the death of my mother, um, felt like no one, people would say, poor this girl. Not only is she le lost her mother, no one cared enough to love her, to even circumcise her. So do you see the craziness? So I yeah. wanted to tell you that world. Then comes the time the day I went through the female circumcision. I really just show you for what it was. And that is to say not to hide it. That is just, if I was the earth, the, 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 the trees I smell, the birds that was coming for, taken for my woman who everything I describe. And the reason I describe everything is so that people can really see this for what it is and that we no longer can downplay this. This is a damn right dangerous practice and it must end, right? And as you see, I tell you throughout, you see me, uh, the story I mentioned, and then at the, again, I went back and tell you a little, and in the end, you see me sharing that arm, right? And saying to my grandmothers, yeah, I love you. Yes, you're a great woman, but this I must I must not carry on. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So um, we we do have a couple questions in the mm -hmm. chat, and I'll I'll just kind of integrate them throughout our conversation. But one is from Don Custer. She wants to know what did you eat when you were a nomad? Yeah, <laughs> it's funny. Different people eat something. Uh, we drink. We eat. Somalis drink a lot of camel milk and camel milk actually studies are now showing that the, the, it's very immune benefit. Um, I have a mom who called me for using it. What was she was saying? Like she was drinking for her autistic child or something. But the main thing is that the, the, the concrete evidence is camel milk is very densely nutritious and immune is, is very good for immune right so we drink that one we eat something called otka which is make it um a meat that's been cut into small pieces and preserved in um oil or butter we eat something called that so this flour things that you um uh, kind of like take the dough and you know you can flatten and then you have this dome of hot sand and you just shove it in there and then it cooks it um so you know, uh, sometimes yogurt, we make milk out of yogurt. You see me singing the song. So uh, singing to the hand, right? To ask her, somebody, uh, be nice to the hand so it can give us good ear or good yogurt, right? <laughs> so I think, you know, so we eat. Sometimes people drink tea with milk. Sometimes people even cook rice. So there are things that adults used to eat that I used to see. Um, I didn't venture on too much, but that's a very good question. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Don. Yeah. Um, Mark Christ wants to know, how did you fit time to write inside your busy day? Like, how did you... <laughs> Oh, I, I think I could have write, probably written more, but because I am lazy, I didn't probably get to do all the things. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I don't think that it, um, you know, I think when 
the truth is when I started this book, I was working as a nurse and I was have my kid. And I just, what I used to do is I work as a nurse. And of course, sometimes we get home and I will write at night a lot. And then during the weekend, I will edit. So it took a lot of weekend of my children away sometimes. <laughs> so there is a price to pay, you know? So, yeah. But the good news is I did this when they are not um, latching on to me. Like, you know, like I did them when my youngest was like, you know, my youngest was the one who got affected most. She probably was eight or nine, but the other two were like much older, like maybe 15 because, yeah, yeah, 14 or 15, yeah. Well, I feel like the it was probably – healing for you I mean you said you wrote it for healing for everyone but you were healing while you were writing yeah because I, it was really laying a very good question it was healing for me because the chapter that I said was very hard to write after I have my breakdown people <laughs> it was all better because I needed to all that was living in me and I look like oh I'm fine everything's fine I'm I maybe I look like and maybe I was a bit fine, but deep down, now I can write, talk about that ch chapter without coming undone. And I think that chapter was really hard because as a mother, I know how much I love my children and I know how much I want something for them. And I know how much I worry for them. They go, and I go, oh, you know, like they, they, I, they are my everything. And imagine, it made me realize that sometimes I'll have infections or I will have a boil in my, and my um, white caregivers will say like, oh, you look, you're limping, what's going on? Maybe that is af day days after I've been limping with that. So mother and father and parents, we are just, you know, to have that is everything to the child, right? And I, perhaps I felt like I've been cheated of something and, Perhaps that brought me to my deep vulnerability because like it made me feel small and I was small and it was just like all kind of emotions that I haven't dealt with it come up, you know? And yeah. It me feel like, yeah. So you you wrote about, you know, how when you were in Canada, you'd never seen snow before. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Let alone like any of the things most people um, take for granted when we're here in North, you know, North America, we take elevators and washing machines and all of that for granted. And like, what were some of the major things you had to learn in your first few years in North America? And how did you adjust to the new society? Uh, culture? Oh, Lena. Mm. <laughs> I felt like that movie. I don't know if anybody's seen God Must Be Crazy. <laughs> <laughs> It's like this father, like with a bottle land on him. And it's like, where did you come from? Like, right. truly descent when the plane was descending down to land, right in Canada. I was like, I saw snows, like I saw mountains of ice. And I asked my sister what this was, and she said, "Baraf." And "Baraf" in Somali is ice. And I'm thinking, as you know, I what we see, what I come to encounter was not an ice, right? That was like uh, uh, snow. And the idea that I'm supposed to live here and thrive and be a human being and still function in joint moving, like what on earth is going wrong with this book? I thought I was just, I'm going to die. This is really like truly my joint will just get, I'm going to just freeze somewhere and they'll find him. He said, take her to the desert. Just start now. So truly. And then add to that, apparently um, my sister who I come to live with her at that time, was living in the ghetto of Ottawa, right? And so I was living with these people who were really <laughs> like, imagine I showed up in the ghetto. So like, it was really like so different, you know? Yeah. And it was, I didn't know how to use all, I washed everything by hand. So washing machine was like, like rumbling down in the basement. I'm like, what is that sound? Or that is washing the clothes or microwave or taking an escalator. I thought that thing would, either get me naked or fly me off my feet or do. And there's a scene I never told you guys. In Canada, when you take the bus, um, you know, here I am, young, maybe perhaps 18, 18 17. So let's calculate 74, wherever, like, and 93. 
like I arrived 92, but really by the time I'm doing something, maybe it might have been like somewhere late in 92. So I'm moving around in this world and it is, I'm young, so I don't want to look like stupid, you know? You're a teenager, so you don't, right. want, you don't want that cute boy seeing you messing up. <laughs> <laughs> like, so, so I've taken the bus, and every time you take the bus, there is a way that to get off. Sometimes you ring, you pull a rope. Sometimes you step down and it just open. Sometimes you do, do certain twists, and I'm like, could you make, could you, you, could you have made it more complicated than that? Like to get this nomadic girl, like just, it was so stimulating. I remember just one day I didn't know, I did all of the thing I thought I needed to do and the damn bus still continued. So I just passed <laughs> <laughs> and on, like, what the heck? We're going to go somewhere today, should we? I end up the bottom of Ottawa at the, you know, way out in the peripheral. And then when the bus driver was alone, I asked him to help me because by then I didn't have audience. And, and I was like, you know, he was nice enough. He told me, but you know what I mean? I'm trying to be cool at the same time and not embarrassed. So I look like I was a disastrous, right? Like, I probably, <laughs> like Mr. Bean, you know, embarrassment, complete embarrassment, you know, yeah. but Luckily, I was um, no cute guys was on that bus. Let's just say, you know. Just. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, you talk about how you, you know, your life was about storytelling. All of yeah. your family, your grandmother. Yeah. So how? Tell us about the process of putting it in writing. Your story, like, is was that you know? Be I see how energetic you are. I love hearing you talk. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Hopefully you can understand that. I roll the R. You know, my girlfriend said, you roll the R. Like I said, I said, is yeah. it my, my rolled R? You know? <laughs> <laughs> but for, you know, inspiring people to put their stories on paper and to maybe write their own books, like tell, talk to us about that process and what yeah. you would say to an inspiring writer. You know, honestly, Humans are very interesting to me because when I start, when I embark this journey of trying to tell my story, everybody bestow their fear on you. Oh no, what makes you think you can write? Oh no, oh, it's a disaster. It's, you're not going to fight. Same when I try to become an infusion nurse, you know, they tell me the same thing. No way. And now I'm the per person who starts difficult IVs. And apparently it can be done, right? But people were like, no, no, you have to go through this. And people wanted to do steps that they see other people did. And that is how it's done. And that is, and I am like unorthodox, like, okay, let's flip this, this <laughs> land of yours upside down and put it like a little bit of shukri. Let's do, do yeah. it. So <laughs> thank God I didn't have the fear people have. People say, would you have a degree in literature? I go, actually, not only do I not have a degree in literature, I don't like writing. And then also I said, I was a kind of student who did well in chemistry and math. Like I was one of those students, whatever class I'm thrown, I will always do well with chemistry and do. But ask me to write and I go, oh, no, no. But you have to believe something. And what I believed about me is that I'm a storyteller. What I believed about me that I come from a long line of storytelling. What I believed about me is that this book of mine will get its day. What I believed about me was so many of you are out there and you are my village and you will create this little whisper that will add up to a shout. That's exactly what's happening. I did not take anybody's fear. I just continue. I focus what I need to do. I just plug it along. And then one day we're here. <laughs> I love so it. That is, I tell people, write your story. What people do, I see now people approaching me. What people do is, oh my God, I'm going to write. Don't worry. First of all, write the damn book. Right. Then talk to people. Like, don't go like, don't be like, huh, don't be showing people and then they will destroy your self esteem. If you believe it's good, believe it. Keep continuing writing. Finish it. Added it, get into laugh with it, uh, look at it, say, what the heck was I trying to say? That's a very normal process. One day your self-esteem is good, the other day it's plummet into the bottom of the stock. Just, just write Dude. the word. And then when time comes, this is what I always did. I tell anybody who's willing to listen to my story, tell your story. One day somebody will say, wow, that's really a good story. 
Perhaps I can make a movie out of it. Or perhaps I can, I can help you tell, you know, get it published. So that's what I did. I tell anyone who's listening, um, believe me, tell me, blunt of what I call or follow up did not add up to me substantial. Some people were actually drove me crazy. And I'm like, that's it. Whatever, like, mind that left, it's going to get lost chasing you. Like, you know what I mean? Some will help, some will drive you crazy. But in the end, you must believe that if you believe, it comes to life. Oh, that's very inspirational. Thank you for that sharing. Really, really believe in yourself. Like, I still, like, get nervous. Like, even I'm writing, I still get nervous every time. I still go over the sentence and I go, I am done. I can't even finish a sentence. Yet, I persist. Yeah. You know, like I, I said, I rather, Elaine, I rather start a difficult IV than a write a paragraph. <laughs> so, <laughs> but then again, look at me, I wrote a whole book, you know. When this book was three b- books long, it was a thousand page when I finished. Wow. I finally learned how to tame some of the grammars. Semicolon, you go there. Comma, you go there. Colons, you are fisting my columns. You are going there. <laughs> <laughs> so... What was the, what, was there anything that was harder? And we talked about it. We didn't really get into it. I believe it's chapter six. That was, you said the hardest part for you to write. The chapter I believe is called Orphanage. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Tell us what, why, and how did you just kind of push yourself through that process? I think sometimes I'm one of those people who, when emotions come up, right? Um, sometimes you want to run away from them, right? Yeah, yeah. And, and I'm like, and I'm a desert woman. I can run from a lion. So, and an angry war hawk. So my initial thing, run. But there are times you need to sit with the feeling, right? And perhaps say, be okay with this vulnerability. It's dug in anime. And then once is I discover like, okay, there was injustice committed. You were a, a child. No one told you. They dropped you in an orphanage. Um, you felt like unwanted. What is it feeling that is bringing from you? And so the adults should have to reckon with that. And, and I listen to myself and I cry and I whimper and I just let it process through myself. And then cry and cry and cry and I think it just processed so what was born was healing but like I say Lena to you earlier and we touched upon this chapter is it it, it is that this chapter was telling me I have undealt stories Shukri and yeah you're you're here living among the hippies you're this mom who have her friend you're hiking all looks well but um that chapter and the chapter when we're running um, from the Civil War were a little bit harder chapters to write, believe it or not. Both of them, again, dealing with that vulnerability of, of being a refugee and desperate and close to begging, you know. And I think for someone who's, you know, we all have a little bit ego. Perhaps I didn't want that, you know, to be telling, yeah, you know, I time was desperate, you know, and yeah. couldn't take shower, couldn't do anything. It was like, it was just, it was just desperate time. And that's the time also I almost get braved. You know, sometimes, Lena, you think things are forgotten and you're done with it. And I have an f- interesting story to tell you. Um, when my brother passed away, it was during the pandemic, April 4th of this year. It was really hard time. I just recovered from that deep sickness. And I thought, my husband is seeing, oh, Shukri, you're eating a little bit better. Perhaps I'm gaining a little bit weight. I'm drinking shake. Trust me, like I, I saw death. And then here I am, my beloved brother is gone. And I like really coming undone. And there's a guy who's helping me so much, Yusuf. And I just love this man because he was there when I'm not there, like feeding my brother was homeless in the end. And he succumbed to alcohol, mental illness, everything. He was brought to his knee. Mm. And I am the sister who chased him everywhere who couldn't save him. And I remember as I'm going to the thing, this guy who's helping my brother is from the town that I almost get raped in Gariso. 
Oh, wow. He knows the guy who raped me and he said to him, so I say to him, oh, so you know Idris? He said, yeah, I know Idris, as people will read. And I am listening. And I knew Idris because he come from a rich family, military family who was Somali Kenyan. I knew he was going to be okay. I knew this boy who raped, tried to rape me will be rewarded for what he did to me. And as a woman, I have to carry the shame. And, um, and then I saw, he said, oh, yeah, Idris. I said, so... I kind of get curious. I said, oh, what is he doing? And he said, oh, he's a pilot. So it did is, the guy who did that to me is one big pilot. And, and I have, I, it's almost my body lifted. And I, I imagine meeting him one day or visiting, like entering his plane, because I'm always very polite. I always thank the crew um, people. I always thank the pilot. pilot. I'm one of those people who clap when pilot land as well. Good job. But that was a smooth landing, like who asking me, right? <laughs> and then, Lena, this, the idea that a man who tried to rape me could be the captain, who could be, yeah. that didn't sit well with me. And I, um, so sometimes I just imagine, I imagine confronting him and I imagine telling him in my imaginary time i told him all that he did to me i imagine him walking into me trying to greet me I imagine i'm like no you did this you are not a you did do you remember this face like I, i'm i'm probably gonna do that and imagine how life right we are all of us a six degree of separation the man who's trying to help me with my brother knows grew he grew up with that rapist mm. That's life. Yeah. You are, you are amazing, by the way. Thank you. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. yes. Um, fascinating story. And for you to be able to share it in the way you do, mm -hmm. just authentic, you yeah. know, and unapologetic because you have nothing to be sorry about. You're nothing we have to, yeah. Yes. So thank you for sharing your story. Um, we're coming close to the end of our conversation and I want to make sure you share whatever you want to share um, with the audience and what do you well, want your readers to know about this book? I think honestly, I know a lot of, I was watching some people entering things in Amazon on various places. I think honestly, people who are texting me, my friends are like, I know you told us about this story, but Shukri, I really did not know it was this good. So what I, I was so in the intricate on, on details of the story, I forgot, you know, in the end, you know, we were so busy, the last final edit, that you forget how beautiful it is for someone who never heard. I think by the end of the day, I really hope that take a chance and read. And I think you are really gonna enjoy. And even the thing that you think, like I don't wanna read about female circumcision. Honestly, it is not written in a way to make you feel sorry for me. To, it's just a mode to educate you, it's a mode to make you in, enlighten, you know? I, I uh, um, purposely really excavate you the world that is so different than you. At the same time, I am your Native American girl. I am growing up here. I'm one of you. I just happen to carry all of this wisdoms and portal. So like, I'm also one of you, like you. I'm like, I'm thinking, what am I going to have for dinner? You know, I'm thinking maybe watching some news. Like, I'm just like roller skating, like hiking. Like, I'm just one of you. So your problems are you, my problem. Yet, I just want you to take a walk in my shoes. And I want you, if you are here, to just bother yourself and be my... Um, village of people who who their whisper add up to loud shout and really if this book comes really gains the attention and need is perhaps we can stop people from circumcising young women if that is what it does in the end I would be very good because I really thought all of this celebrities all of these people are getting this book other books out there but this is one book that perhaps if they pay attention people can say why is this happening still it happened to Shukri. Shukri lives in California. She's a soccer mom. She's one of us. Why? Is, if this is happening to her and it's still happening to a Somali girl, what can we do to help? And, um, and I think that would really make me very happy if we can all, um, you know, 
be that. And the end, I'm really interested if, if it generates enough thing. Really, I have a goal to help refugees and educate women. So perhaps if it allows me to do these goals, then I'm really happy. But I have more stories to tell. And I am so touched by all of you guys. And um, what is it called? Uh, the, the library. Uh, the Cal Library yeah. System. Cows. Yeah. We call it cows. <laughs> yeah. It's so amazing. And however, get it from the library. Whatever you they can help for this tonight event would be good too. You know, all of that is... It's really good. It's a tough time for a lot of libraries and bookstores and a lot of those places. Yeah. So it's kind of a drought season. So we can all bring some water by helping financially. Right? <laughs> Help us out of this drought. Like, you know, yeah. Well, well, Mark Christ said, amazing, dot, dot, dot. You can say that again. He's talking about you. <laughs> oh. Mark, thank you. I see a few of you here. Um, there's somebody called M. Scott and... Yeah, all yeah. I can see. Maybe there are two people watching us. Who knows? <laughs> and maybe at some point you can have these conversations in person with people. Oh, uh, we miss that. But to be honest, it sounds like some. Sometimes something is taken from you, and something's given to you. In this case, sure. they, uh, you know, we're gaining. People can just speak making salad, making a nice tea, eating a chocolate. Who knows? Maybe Mark and <laughs> Max. That's what he's doing, and <laughs> they can just watch you. So it's and you I, get to be with your family. Yeah, and I get to be. And I go, once in a while, I go, "What are you doing? Don't come back and be running naked around people like." <laughs> <laughs> I can't help you. It's going to end up on TV. <laughs> oh, again, thank you so much uh, for sharing everything. And we really appreciate you. It's 726. We can keep talking if you want. If you I, I have a question for you, Lena. Uh-oh. <laughs> I have a question for you, Lena. How did you hear about the book? Well, I honestly heard from it through cows. Uh, from who? Through who? The Central Arkansas Library System. They were the ones that introduced me to you. No way. Oh, yes. I am so appreciative of them. So it got to them already. Yes. And then they've been obviously promoting you as well as other phenomenal artists, oh. you know, here, throughout the state. And it's a well-respected, you know, the cows in the festival it's been around oh, for years, and so... I have to come there one day. So do you know when they do these festivals? Like, usually, yep. it would have been in person, right? It would yes. have been... So yes. I have to come there because they owe me one, right? I said, <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. That Zoom thing, this is Zoom. I'm showing up now. Show me some love here. <laughs> hey, listen, you're going to bring that next book. You're Maybe gonna... I'll bring my camera as well. I say, let's go. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much. I have so much respect for you in so many ways. I didn't tell you, but I work at Baptist Health oh, um, oh. Hospital Medical Center. So I'm, I see it firsthand. Are you a nurse you. as well? Are you a yeah. nurse? Yeah, no, I'm not a nurse, no. But so, I but work you know here. what it's like to I see the nurses firsthand. So I commend oh. you on every oh, level. <laughs> you, know, you are you and Nate and Carl Library. You guys are so amazing. I'm just so grateful that a library in Arkansas, you know, Carl is yeah. know about me. Like that's yeah. just amazing to me. How do they even know? Like I'm just so touched because I'm often fascinated how. Uh, or it's maybe because I'm such an oral tradition person. I'm interested how mouth of word travels, right? Like I'm wondering how they hear about it as well. So like I could go on, that could be my rabbit hole, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, Nathan Smith said, we'd be excited to have you come to Arkansas. So please do do that someday for yeah. us. Yes, Lane, and I have your email, you and Nate, uh, Nathan, I think. And Nathan, thank you so much. I know you're hiding somewhere underneath there, but thank you so much. <laughs> you were helping us out so much, Nathan. So we have really more said great conversation. So thank you. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah, you take care, and it's thank 729. Yeah. Do I turn it off from here, or Nate does it? I have no idea. <laughs> I'll just turn it off. Bye.